It's really a pleasure to be back here on stage. I actually used to work here uh, <laughs> a while back, uh, four or five years ago. So it's, I really feel like I'm returning home in a way. And uh, it's also a pleasure to have um, colleagues and uh, my fellow programmers. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't have that many uh, programmers panels in the city. So I thought it'd be interesting uh, uh, to talk with you guys. We often have conversation um, on Asian cinema and, and Korean cinema in particular. So I think thought it'd be interesting and enlightening perhaps uh, to make this public and to see uh, we, are, we are really I think in a unique position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Korean film industry we get to see the film sometimes months sometimes even years before the pub public get to see them uh, so that gives us access that gives us access to special information so I would like to ask you first about uh, how you view uh, how you envision uh, your programming activities what you've done related to Korean cinema and then we will we'll perhaps uh, speak more on uh, uh, Korean cinema itself I start with you uh, Tom at the Smithsonian Institution sure. Uh, well, the museum I work for is the Smithsonian Institution's Museum of Asian Art. So my duty is to kind of show uh, Asian film as an art form in itself. Uh, so I do an annual Korean film festival. And the, and the goal is really to kind of introduce uh, new films as a kind of panorama of what kind of filmmaking is going on in Korea, as well as I normally do a director retrospective and invite the director, and often a kind of selection of classic films. And even the classic films are basically new to American audiences usually. So for me, it's sort of trying to capture what kind of filmmaking is going on in Korea, you know, in any given year and basically introducing it to audiences in Washington. Yeah. Uh, what about you, uh, Nicolas? You work in a different territory? Yes, I'm uh, working at Fantasia International Film Festival, which is a genre film festival. Uh, we're both an international and Asian uh, event. It's about 40, 60. Uh, percent uh, programming and I'm responsible for Korea, Japan and Southeast Asia. So uh, my view of programming, especially in a genre film festival, is to uh, bring tendencies and to, to, to show uh, what the, the, the general production of in Korea look like in, within one year and uh, also uh, yeah to, to bring films related to pop, pop culture because uh, mm -hmm. Fantasia is a, a big event uh, related to pop culture so and uh, I'm really proud that we're probably the one of the best windows yeah, for really Korean cinema. Event. I was actually at Fantasia last year for the first time. It's yeah. a pretty massive event, <laughs> very fan oriented. Uh, if you have a, a chance to go to Montreal, I think you should definitely <laughs> take a detour via the festival. It's, uh, it happens every year. Uh, in July in and July. August, it's probably one of the longest festivals in the world. It's from <coughs> this year is from July 17 to. So if you don't have a job, you August. can go to Montreal. <laughs> uh, Even if you have a job, you like the, the, it's take not too long coming yeah. to Montreal. It's good, and there's a lot of festivals and yeah, and especially Fantasia. So if you have a good job with a lot of vacation, you can also go to... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Rufus, uh, your turn. What, did, what do you have to say about our festival? Well, I think... Uh, our, our we work together. Yes, just we, we work together on one of the three, three sort of uh, main guys on the ground during the festival, uh, along with Sam and Grant Palvik, who couldn't be here tonight. Uh, but our, our festival is... is, is only Asian cinema, and a large percentage of that uh, was Korean film. In fact, the Subway Cinema really started programming Korean film in New York City. We started the <coughs> Korean Film Festival. Uh, we were some of the first people to bring in Korean films to be screened in New York um, before I started there, of course. Uh, and our, I think our sort of mission has changed now that we're at lincoln center we're, we've sort of transitioned from purely genre to uh genre mixed with art house and some documentaries uh and since we have a kind of unique festival in that we are only asian film it, it really brings to light sort of the uh, trends in Asian film and so it's an interesting I, I think we we really try to program along these trends like so what's going on in Korea how is how is it sort of compare and contrast to China or Hong Kong or Japan or um, and we also do a wide program of Korean short films 
that we we program recently we've been partnering with drama fever to stream them online so i mean we i think we're in a unique position to sort of have like a, a larger overview of the asian industry Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I should add that uh, we run uh, every year in um, uh, shortly before Fantasia, yeah. uh, between mm -hmm. June 27th and July 14th. Yes. Uh, our main venue is uh, the Lincoln Center, as you as you pointed out. So you you're just talking about uh, Korean cinema vis-à-vis -vis the uh, other uh, industries in East Asia. So I'm going to ask you uh, all th uh, all all three of you. Um, well, would you, how do you see Korean cinema vis-à-vis -vis the other East Asian uh, film industries, particularly Japan or China or Hong Kong, all big uh, industries with a long record of placing films in, in all the ma major um, uh, film festivals in the world, in Cannes, Berlin, and so on and so forth. So how do you see, uh, how do you see Korean cinema uh, in relation to those other uh, East cinemas? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's hard to avoid that word. Uh, I mean, I think the the thing that's always been kind of unique about Korean cinema is that it's so diverse. I mean, you know, when, when Hong Kong films were big twenty years ago, it was all about action movies and kung fu. And with Korea, you have, you know, uh, lots of independent filmmakers making, for lack of a better word, art house films, and as well as like big kind of genre Hollywood style movies that are really well made. So, I mean, for me, it's what attracted me to Korean cinema, and I think what I try to present and what I think makes it unique is this wide variety of kinds of films and all made on their own terms, like very well, you know? I mean, that's what's impressed me over the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what about you, uh, Nico? For me, it's the, the, for, it's, it's the fact that Korean cinema doesn't make a difference between genre, genre cinema and author cinema. Mm. Uh, it's, it's really a mix and they, they, they bring social issues into uh, like high octane thriller, mm -hmm. and for uh, a genre film festival like us, it's it's gold, it's pure gold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, the 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 production values mm -hmm. that is for me on a par with Hollywood um, is another reason why uh, Korean cinema come maybe I don't like to compare to other, but for for a territory like Canada or North America is pretty attracting. Um, and uh, yeah, the intensity. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that yeah, it's it's, it's different from Hollywood. It's it's the production values are, are on par. Everything is is as good, but there's it, there's no need to have that happy ending or that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that's yes. Yeah. He's dead. No, <laughs> It's really the the mixing of genres that makes yeah, Korean, yeah. like especially popular cinema, so interesting. Is that you think you're you're in an action movie and it becomes a melodrama for a while, and then it sort of goes yeah. somewhere else, and it's yeah. kind of exciting to sort of you be taken on that kind of ride that you don't expect. And know? even comedies, like yeah. for, for for like usually some in some countries in Asia, comedies are really hard to to understand mm -hmm. or are not very accessible. But like at our fan, like Fantasia, uh, it's, it's one of the most popular genre at the festival, like Korean comedies yeah. really work, uh, romantic comedies, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, I think the gas station is still one of the most. Yeah. So the unpredictability element, yeah. I think, is... Yeah. Uh, Accessibility <coughs> too. Also, it's a very yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, w I, I think that you guys hit the nail on the head. I think that's really... I mean, I, the first film, the first Korean film I ever saw in theaters was uh, Kick the Moon uh, <laughs> back in 2001 in Korea. I was in Seoul. And I sat there, and it was a comedy, and then a gangster movie, and then a romance, <laughs> and then a drama. And I felt like I was getting audience whiplash. And, yeah. <laughs> and I was sort of like, I was like, whoa, like these movies are amazing. And, you know, this was back, like, really before they started screening. You know, it was just that year when uh, we screened the Korean F Film Festival right, first yeah. in New York. And, you know, before that, I had. You know, I had no idea. It was easy to go to Chinatown and pick up Hong Kong movies, but there was no real outlet for me to go and pick up Korean movies. And, you know, and I think there, you know, there is this intensity, but there's also this intensity on the part of the industry. Yeah. I mean, this mm -hmm. is this, you know, they hit it big with Shiri and then just said, okay, we're going to mm -hmm. keep going and became one of a handful of countries that retook their box, domestic box office from Hollywood, which is like, yeah just mind-blowing and mm -hmm. i mean the days of globalization that captain america is not even the number one 
you know, box like you know, the Korean movies are consistently number one box yeah. office, mm -hmm. and not even just like a big blockbuster movie like Miracle and Cell Seven, which is you know, mm -hmm. in an American film would never be a blockbuster, but that raised like yeah. that was like twelve million plus attendance in Korea. Mm. So yeah, t so ten years from from that time, the kick, uh, kick the moon, and so on. Uh, where do you think uh, is uh, Korean cinema is now? How do you explain uh, its tremendous success at, at the box office? I'm going to turn uh, uh, to. I mean, in Korea locally, yeah. as uh, Rufus was pointing out, uh, Korean films have taken back their own yeah. uh, territory, so to speak. Yeah, I mean that's interesting to me, uh, especially in light of the, the the quota issue a few years ago when people thought that well Hollywood is just going to flood Korea and then it'll be over. And it's amazing that it stood up. I don't really st study the box office so much myself. I kind of just try to you know experience. But if you talk about how Korean cinema has changed over ten years, and maybe this is the discussion for later, but I think ten years ago you had directors developing track records and becoming household names: Hong Sang Soo, Park Chan Wook, Lee Chang Dong. These you know, guys who have sort of developed as artists over the years that you can watch. And now I think the difference for me is that a director will come along and make one or two fantastic films and just kind of disappear. And I think that's a change in the industry uh, from a production standpoint as to how, who has the power in, in, in making films. And so there are fewer auteurs sort of having the breathing room to really develop. I think you sort of have to prove yourself now. I may be wrong, but prove yourself with your first or second film. And if that doesn't work, then you're kind of out. <laughs> Yeah. And so as a programmer, it's a little bit frustrating to see people kind of, you know, sort of sparkle and then disappear like that. But that's the change that I've noticed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your take on this, Nicola? Yeah, I would say also that, uh, that what maintains uh, Korean cinema so popular in, uh, on, on its own land is maybe the, vari the variety of films. Uh, the fact that, like, if you see one year, it's going to be Miracle in Cell number seven, and then the other year... Uh, the face reader will do super well mm. and it's always different films it's there, there's no it's never like the superhero film every single year <laughs> so i think this is one of the reasons and the the, the way the star system have been uh, mm -hmm. really maintained uh in yeah yeah i mean i Are think you? well from my point of view uh the major major shift was the death of the quota system in 2006 yeah. and the box office like local box office really tanked like to the point where 2008 was like people were sort of worried about the future of korean cinema uh but then cj and lotte and like these big sort of chable like uh, big co companies came in and they created this sort of very much like the old Hollywood system, this vertically integrated mm -hmm. system where they owned distribution, the <clears> studios, <throat> and the thing. And it's great for domestic box office for these big blockbuster movies to the point where people who program and distribute Western films in Korea will not even release films on weekends when these big CJ-backed mm -hmm. films are going to be because they're not going to do well at all in the box office. Uh, the problem becomes when you have something like Face Reader on a thousand screens and something like a uh, Kim Ki Duck movie on 30 screens uh, yeah. out of 3,000 screens in the country. So, of course, the Face Reader is going to do well because it's on a, every single theater in three or four different screens showing at every single hour of the day versus you'd have to, if you're in Seoul, maybe take an hour long subway train just to see the one theater in Seoul that's, you know promoting these art houses, and there, there has been a somewhat shift to try to promote independent films but i do think that there's this has impacted and that's why you see like these great young uh filmmakers a lot of them are female like mm -hmm. making these amazing films with great potential and then they disappear because yeah. there is no box office and mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. they do well in the, the festival circuit but it's not tangible to the the distribution companies to say yeah. like okay. we made 12 million you know 12 million attendance which is like the record right now so, yeah. so you you think that's uh, the recent share uh, do you see any difference uh, as, as that's all, all of you really yeah. uh, specifically in the past two years because really in the past two yes. years uh most people in the in the industry in the trade press would say there's there's been almost like a bubble we don't know if it's a bubble or <laughs> or golden age actually that's that's going to be my question do you think it's mm. uh, a, is it a, a bubble or golden age 2012 13 14 it's continuing <laughs> 
to grow. Now we've br broken the mark yeah. of uh, 100 million admissions, which is insane in a country of yeah. 50 million. <laughs> I mean, people go see films a lot. So, bubble. I mean, in my Golden opinion, age. I mean, I think I think it is more of a bubble. I, I mm. don't think that this system of vertical integration, as you know, witnessed over the past like of film world film history, it just it's not a sustainable model. And even now, there's more risk. There, there, there's less willingness to invest in products that are more. Uh, risky. So there's a lot of risk aversion going on. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, but I'm going to interrupt you there. What about companies like like New, the next entertainment world company? Right. You, you see like more and more, and particularly in the past couple of years, is that... I mean, I don't want to contradict you on that, no. but you know, you've got uh, films like Cold Eyes, which did right. extremely well. Yeah, yeah. It's more like a medium size. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think there's there is room for that, but that's still like. I mean, look at Indie Story. They release like a ton of like they release yeah. a ton of great films, and then they get seen by maybe five hundred thousand people. They get seen by us. Yeah, they yeah. get seen by us, <laughs> and like you know, <laughs> and I think I, I think the other issue is that there's no there's no aftermarket in korea there's no aftermarket like in america a, a movie can you know not do well in the box office and then have good home sales there is no home market in korea the dvd industry in korea is as far as i'm concerned dead, dead. Mm -hmm. um they're they're you know and they haven't quite figured out how to uh mm -hmm. use the infrastructure for streaming or you know like there there's right. attempts and i think there's promise there but i i do think that um this lack of diversity is what's holding it back because the great thing about like say like the late 80s early 90s films which is to me the more modern golden era mm -hmm. uh was the fact that you know you saw films of all si you know, political freedom was allowed to be expressed democratic ideas were mm -hmm. you know criticisms were allowed to finally be talked about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it, it led to more creation and it arguably led to the mm -hmm. creation of these great mm -hmm. filmmakers yeah but, yeah I'm going to turn back to it's yeah. fascinating, but yeah, Sorry. I'm going to ask also the question to. Uh, I think it's going to continue, continue uh, because like this model kind of worked in Hollywood, uh, but I and I think like the, 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 there's new ways to you see more and more um, films that go that do the festival circuit before they're released in Korea, and I think for uh, independent films and like uh, film director like Kim ki uh, like it, it's maybe a way to create a hype and then because because there's like in Canada for instance it's it's really uh, a model that works if if a film does the festival circuit sometime it's released in Canada and then poof, it doesn't work <laughs> and it does the festival circuit and then it comes back in theater and then woo we have super box office <laughs> so maybe there's a way to to just adapt this model but like it's so strong at the moment, I can't see how it could it could stop, like yeah, with with yeah. yeah. What about you, Tom? Well, I mean, I guess as a curator at the Smithsonian, I have the luxury of being an esthete and not thinking about business, which is <laughs> <laughs> probably not so good in my own financial life. But uh, so so I actually I don't think that much about the box office. I mean, in terms of when I'm programming, I might think about okay, this film was you know number one at the box office, but often those films aren't the ones that end up doing well with audiences here. I mean, sometimes they resonate with, with pe people in Korea more than they would here. That's not always the case, but sometimes it's the case. So uh, I don't really track that so as much as you guys obviously do. Um, so I guess I can't really say if it's a bubble or a golden age. I guess we just have to see. Yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, the, the other recent shift perhaps <coughs> also is the uh, per also a translation of um, uh, the success of yeah. Korean cinema as a whole, as an art form, mm -hmm. and as an industry, is the move to Hollywood, mm -hmm. semi move. I don't, <laughs> God knows, it doesn't look like it's going to be permanent. But, uh, but I'm going to ask you the about the bolo move. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We're going, we're going back. Bong Juno, <laughs> right, right, yeah. right, that happened before too. Right? Yeah. Uh, Bong Juno, uh, Kim Ji Hoon, mm -hmm. Pak Chan Wook making their English language. Yeah. Uh, and Hollywood uh, yeah. debuts. I mean, Snowpiercer is not exactly a yeah. Hollywood film, but it's at least an English language debut. So I'm going to ask yeah. you about uh, your thoughts on. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, it's this. interesting because those three filmmakers. I mean, they sort of like grew up on genre movies from you know the U.S. and Europe and everywhere else. I mean, they're kind of like 
global consumers of movies. So it's kind of no accident that they would then be going and working in Hollywood because they already sort of work in that language, you know. Um, I think Snowpiercer, which is, you know, finally going to come out after this very long, tumultuous sort of battle between uh, Bong and the uh, Weinstein companies distributing it. I mean, it's an example of, I think, American distributors' fear of foreign films, even though this is kind of the least foreign film that uh -huh. you can consider a foreign film because it's in English and, you know, there are two Korean actors, but it's basically like an American movie. So uh, that's kind of interesting to me, the sort of fear of this film that's foreign and yet not foreign. Um, I mean, Kim Ji-woo and I, you know, I did my due diligence and I watched The Last Stand and uh, I wanted to find a metaphor between the border <laughs> of U.S. and Mexico and the North Korea and South Korea. And there was just no, I mean, I think he just, you know, he, he it would seem to be a work for hire and, you know, he's good at what he does. The metaphor was Johnny Knoxville. <laughs> <laughs> the walking metaphor. Um, and uh, yeah, and Park Chan-wook, I, 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 I quite liked uh, uh, the film he made and I thought it's, it, he was, there was a case where he was able to retain his style, yep. you know? Um, and uh, so, I mean, who knows where that will go, if he'll go back to Korea or if he'll continue working. But I'd, I, what I would be interested to know, if anyone's talked to those filmmakers about the difference working in Hollywood and working in Seoul, and which, yeah. is, which is more frustrating, I guess, would be the question. <laughs> <laughs> and you see it with the, the, the case of the Snoopers right now, mm -hmm. yeah. with the release dates on the same mm -hmm. day as Transformers, anyway. Yeah, it's being <laughs> but, released in June. Yeah, yeah. but, um, yeah, uh, I really hope none of these great directors will become like I'm sorry to say a Ringo Lam who mm. kind of did two or three Van Damme films and then like yeah maybe we should explain to yeah, the yeah, audience yeah. a little it's a great a Hong Kong director who did like fantastic films uh, uh, and then went to Hong Kong like John Woo John Woo is another example but for him it worked and uh, but he had to go through the Van Damme experience. <laughs> it was all, <laughs> all on Kong. All the directors <laughs> had to go through Van Damme. <laughs> but like, and Ringo Lam didn't survive the, like he ended up doing film with Van Damme and Dennis Rodman and with yeah. shooting. <laughs> in I, I like this <laughs> <laughs> But you have other qualities. It's another <laughs> panel. The Van Damme oh, panel is coming okay. up later. Yeah. So yes, I hope none of them, and, and then he didn't do films in Hong Kong after, if I'm not mistaken, or nothing it's major. Yeah. And so, like, I really wish none of these directors, uh, like, we all deeply love, will... But it's encouraging at the moment because they all seem to come back to make films in Korea. Yeah, and much faster than the Hong Kong directors yeah, yeah, did mm -hmm. back in the days. Because yeah. uh, they stayed in Hollywood for a while and it seems like it's definitely not a permanent move. Yeah. They're already yeah. going back to Korean language films. Mm -hmm. And I hope yeah, it will yeah. be the same with Choi min -shik. Who is doing the <laughs> new Besson film with the? I hope no one is listening to what we're saying. Uh, Rufus, uh, I think I mean out of the three, I think Bong Joon Ho stands to make the like the, the have the longest lasting career in the U.S. Uh, I am sort of I'm not the biggest Pak Chan Wook fan. I mean, I I really like Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, and his movies are good, but I think that like. You know, I'm glad people saw Old Boy and saw like Korean film, but I think there's much better films out there. And I think Kim Ji Woon just had the unfortunate, uh, you know, happy accident, I guess, of coming in to be the director for Arnold's Return to the Screen, and it was clearly the studio did not feel comfortable having uh, a Korean director at the helm of this. And mm -hmm. you can just watching the film, you feel that there is sort of a struggle behind the set of Kim Ji-woon trying to make a Kim Ji-woon film, and then all the producers on set being like, ah, uh, 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 we need more mm. Arnold, we need one-liners, we need, yeah. you know. Johnny Nugget. Um, but Bong Joon-ho, I mean, I really <laughs> enjoyed Snowpiercer, and I think that yeah. it's a great adaptation of the manga, or I mean, not the manga, the, uh, the comic book, um, and it, it will be totally, hopefully successful. I mean, it's a, it's a movie that I think will make money and yeah. people will definitely buy it on Blu-ray and DVD. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, it has definitely the potential. Yeah. yeah. So on the other end of the spectrum, you've got like the film <laughs> festival uh, guys, the film festival directors, people like Kim ki uh pretty famous overseas, not exactly uh, the best loved uh, director <laughs> in Korea necessarily, but um, 
uh, what do you think we're standing now with uh, these directors? Uh, you, you almost have like a Kim ki Dog school now. Yeah. He writes a lot of stories. Uh, Chang yu Hwan, uh, worked with him for a while now. Chang yu Hwan makes films pretty regularly, yeah. interesting films. I think you, uh, Nicolas, particularly your champion, you're championing yeah. the works of Chang yu Hwan. Um, um, I'm, a big I'm just going to say one thing. I hope this is an inspiration for you to watch uh, more films yeah. and more Korean yeah. films specifically. <laughs> We're probably talking about a lot of films that you might or might not have seen. So yeah. I hope you get to watch these films. <laughs> uh, anyway, sorry. Continue. Yes, yeah. there's a uh, like me personally. I'm I'm a big fan of Kim Ki Duk, but I, since uh, maybe two three years, I prefer what is like his pupils or his ex co-directors are doing. And with him writing this and pr uh, often producing uh, films like uh, Pung San mm -hmm. uh, by Jung Jae Young, uh, yeah, uh, Rough Cut, mm -hmm. uh, Rough Play, and this year is uh, an especially like like uh, interesting year with uh, films like Red Family, Rough Play. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm forgetting, but anyway, <laughs> but uh, that there are at least like there are more and more uh, directors coming uh, who, who were co-directors with Kim Ki Duk who are do having great careers, and I think it's it's it's, it's a good way to to have a um, have a live uh, a new generation a new, a new, a new generation, generation of uh, mm -hmm. filmmakers and to see them interact and mm -hmm. uh, it. it it reminded me of the the kind of so-called uh, Korean wave. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm. yeah. Uh, so you think there's a future in there's this a future generation. in there, yeah. And you see, you see most of most of these directors, uh, they, they they can go from uh, like uh, a really genre a genre film really not accessible mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for a wide audience who is doing well on the festival circuit to a mm -hmm. film like I don't know, Secretly Greatly. Mm -hmm. Right and and yeah, doing uh, yeah, so yeah. there's a <coughs> a kind of yeah it's oh, it's it's people who can do a, who have a lot of talent and uh, it's really a place to 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 watch. Tom, I mean that's kind of your specialty. You really yeah, have yeah. a directorial based approach in terms of curating. Yeah, yeah. You try to really pick interesting yeah. people with a vision. So you're, yeah. you're probably more direct oriented than we are as a yeah, you know, yeah, genre. Yeah. Like oh horror, oh cool. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah maybe so. Maybe but I mean. So. Speaking of Kim Ki Duck, a few years ago he made a documentary called Ari Rang, which is, I mean, uh, maybe best described as a kind of staged nervous breakdown on film. He'd become very frustrated with the Korean film industry. He'd made a lot of enemies. He felt he'd been betrayed. And so he went and lived in a house, well, actually a tent inside a house on a mountain and made this documentary about himself, by himself. He gets drunk and interviews himself. He sort of watches his old movies and cries. I mean, it's really amazing. Uh, but... <laughs> I mean, after I saw it, I thought, well, every filmmaker at that point in their career should probably do that because it revitalized him, you know, both in his own films and in this, how he's now become this sort of mentor to these yep. other young filmmakers. I mean, I think that, you know, it, it, as staged as it was, I think it was also maybe a sort of cleansing experience for him. Yeah. Uh, and now he's inspiring or, and helping out this younger bunch of filmmakers, which I think is great because that kind of has been missing a bit. But yeah, I mean, I yeah, I do sort of follow directors. Uh, uh, Hong Sang Soo is another one that I follow. I mean, he's sort of like maybe the opposite pole of Kim Ki Duk in that he just steadily keeps making his own genre of movies, which are Hong Sang Soo movies. But you know, even he has kind of become more of a global filmmaker. He made a film in France. He's had you know European actors in his films. So that that sort of interaction of Korean filmmakers with the rest of the world, both on the popular level and this kind of independent auteur level, is really interesting to me. And, I'm interested to see where that will go. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm gonna end with you, Rufus, on this. I mean, I've we, I mean, at New York uh, Asian Film Festival. We're not definitely sort of an auteurist festival, <laughs> but uh, I do think it is interesting, sort of looking at this uh, path and comparing it to say like Taiwanese film or uh, like you know where you have uh, like Ho Shao Shen or. That, like who might not be popular domestically, but are incredibly popular worldwide, and I think that it it just serves to further uh, the the sort of Korean film in the eyes of the world because somebody sees, oh, Kim Ki Duk just won at Cannes Film Festival. It's a Korean film. What else is there? Like, what else can I watch? Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting too that you know Kim Ki Duk 
especially because he's such a maverick within the film industry, I am really curious because he has been very much against this sort of vertical integration system and to see what he and this sort of growing, you know, mad roving gang of amazing filmmakers are going to do to the industry. Like, I yeah. really hope they sort of shake it up and, um, cause I love all like secretly yeah. greatly. I mean, the devil, like these are really intense films that are this mixture of great genres and art film sensibilities. And, um, I think that he's very smart in how foreign audiences will react to these films. And he's very much, training these directors to be not only Korean filmmakers, but international filmmakers. Um, so. Great. I think uh, now it's probably time to turn to the audience. Uh, you might have questions. I think a microphone would be uh, circulating. So if you have any questions for the panelists here, please shoot away. Or I can actually continue, we could continue <laughs> this conversation. Yeah. Uh, do you have any uh, questions for the, the panel? No. Uh, Daniel, you want to start? Sure. Is um, when talking to Korean directors, it seems that it's very much their projects. Like they wrote it, they directed it, they edited it, they wrote the music. <laughs> is is there something about the way Korean films get made, um, as opposed to how it's done in Hollywood or in other countries, uh, mm -hmm. that gives the you know something special or something different uh, to to Korean cinema? Mm. I mean, uh, th th that immediately brings to mind Hong Sung Soo, which is the director I mentioned earlier. And he makes these very small films. He makes them very cheaply. He gets famous actors to work very cheaply. Uh, so his method is to just basically kind of keep the cost down, and that gives him creative control, and he's able to do that. I don't think that's the case with every director. And maybe, Rufus, you probably know more about the sort of larger industry, but you know whether they have more creative control or less than, say, people in Hollywood, I don't know. I mean, I, th I, th I think it depends on the project. It really mm -hmm. does. I think that if you have cultural capital, then you're going to have more freedom. But if you're a young filmmaker starting out, you might make one or two sort of very stylistically distinct films that may do okay in the domestic box office. And then, you know, I'm thinking of an, a specific example that I'm not going to name, but they made a very stylistic film that was did not do well in the box office. And in their next film, they actually there was a contractual agreement that they were not going to introduce the stylistic things and he was <laughs> they're just going to make a straightforward film uh so i think it really depends who you're working for um because if the budget is you know a hundred billion one or something i mean you're not going to have much creative control because they're going to want to make sure that it's going to have a return on investment but if you have a hong sang su situation where you can just say, okay, famous actors come here. We're going to get drunk. We're going to shoot a scene <laughs> where, you know. Yeah, that's actually how he makes it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly how he makes it. <laughs> Very cheap. But maybe this is when a guy like King ki who is representing Korea all around the world, who can back these young directors who are full of potential and maybe bring them to another step. And I think this is what we're seeing right now. Yeah. I think overall, still, I mean, it's very director-oriented, yeah. the work. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's compared a, with Japan, yeah. uh, in Japan, you're the producer, you're the, you're the king. I mean, uh, in <laughs> Korea, it's still, I mean, once you're on the set, the director has a lot of power. Well, I think it's, it's, it's a very much our tourist film industry. I mean, I think that you have, you know, mm -hmm. like the director is this very strong. Right. With the nuance of the yeah. project, if it's yeah. a big studio project, obviously the money kind of turns right. everything, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I hope that answers the question. Actually, Kyung, we could answer that pretty easily. <laughs> You're a film producer, you know these things. We have someone <laughs> in the audience here who actually is quite familiar with the filmmaking process. It's, it's very, you, you want to answer that maybe a little, a little more? <laughs> Because yeah. you know about it. You, uh, the, uh, Kim Kyung Mi is uh, in your uh, attendance now. He's <laughs> actually a film producer. She produced yeah, so I movies. was uh, working uh, with uh, Kim Gidok production for Pungsan and as an executive producer myself. So he, in his case, actually, he has a, like an international market. So And also, he, he has his own capital to make the film. So, you know, the himself, he's a film, the documentary, including Arirang and also the Pungsan and other films and actually he capitalized and because he actually <laughs> with Pung San he made a actually like almost like a million mm -hmm. money so right. he has uh 
he has uh, money for himself, so he actually invests his mm-hmm. uh, younger, you know, the filmmakers to produce. And also, he is a partner, international sales company. They actually kept, they also, like, you know, the put their own uh, front money. So, mm-hmm. so like, $100,000, uh, actually, that money he can... <laughs> Finance himself. So mm-hmm. lately, also the Chen Zeyong, the director mm-hmm. of Pungsani, lately he actually make a film like a thirty thousand dollars, and mm-hmm. by by himself, like he financed uh, twenty thousand and ten thousand another money from the product uh, another producer. So those money actually possible to make. Uh, indie film in Korea right now, and also it's not so really very small amounts of money. Yeah, right, yeah. So below like a hundred thousand dollar, yeah. actually, there is money, and it, yeah, Hong Sang Soo and Kim Gi Duk they have a money. Uh, they have already name in international scene. So actually, so that reinforces the yeah. the fact that yeah. they raise the capital. That's yeah, so be- below hundred thousand dollar, and actually, even like a big star, they wanna you know star their film. So. That for the respectability yeah, and yeah. All, I mean, uh, all the But movie. right now, the problem is actually lately the you know CJ like you know big produ- uh, the the company they actually want to make you know mm-hmm. more like indie film. So they actually really control the project lately. So they actually bad uh, reputation. So they shift that. the power to the producers rather than the directors themselves. Yeah, they words, try. They yeah, try, they but try, I right. think that I think that some cases i'm not comfortable to mention which title but <laughs> yeah, yeah no, because the be director right had a very <laughs> e- even myself though lately i i produced uh, my you know the documentary art and actually i had a bad, bad experience with uh you know studio money and, and yeah, actually Adrian I, Ryan, you're saying Adrian, mm-hmm. Adrian Ryan. so myself i really financed myself so right now the the because right now the every studio they're looking for like second generation of Bong Juno. Mm-hmm. So they mm-hmm. kind of really see the like a value of uh, new talent in in the market. So that's why there there are like uh, the CGV, you know, the collage or CJ, they also have some like money for those projects, but they actually really mismanage the money mm-hmm. right now. So I think that right now actually the in this scene are interesting because they actually can find their own, you know, financing sources and even like a small uh, market, mm-hmm. but it, it has a own distribution sources mm-hmm. at, you know, the big, you know, the theoretical chain. So, so we have the insider yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> view. You see like there's, uh, the, the industry is really structured, like we yeah. have the programmers yeah. have access <laughs> to certain type of information, yeah, yeah, yeah. the production <laughs> size, like yeah. the money and the money. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but that's really fascinating to see. Uh, any other questions in the, uh, yes, the lady over there? Thanks, Kong. I, I have a few questions. Um, you said that it was a happy accident that for The Last Stand, the, the Korean director. So I was wondering, are these Korean directors recruited by Hollywood or is it their goal and dream to actually ultimately work in Hollywood? And then um, the next question I had was, um, if you had one film to recommend that is a must-see of a Korean oh, film, <laughs> um, what, what would it be for all of you? And finally, um, are there any films that we should be looking out for in the future, in the coming year or two? That's a lot of questions. Yeah. yeah. You, you want to you wanna start, Rufus? You, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think maybe I should have said unhappy accident because uh, Last Stand was plagued with issues. I, I, I don't know. I think it was a different. I think it was, a, I think it was, you know, with Bong Joon-ho, he just wanted to make that film. It wasn't a desire to maybe break in. He just, that was the film that spoke to him and he, you know, he really wanted to make it. And I think that's why, in my mind, like, that's sort of the cream of the top, like that's the top film of those three films because there was this passion behind it. Whereas Kim Ji-woon, I think, was was actually sort of, he had made it sort of, I saw the devil as kind of a calling card, but then he was recruited for that specific mm. project. Mm. And Park Chan-wook, I'm not so sure about the background for Stoker, so. Um, all right, and then what was the other well, question? The story oh. was re- written by Wentworth Miller, so okay. that's oh, yeah. not actually yeah. his own story. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so the the number one mo- Korean movie that everyone needs to see is not even a new Korean movie. It's The Housemaid by uh, Kim Ki-young. Uh, it's an absolute phenomenal film. 
Uh, the old one, we really talked yeah, about it. Yeah, the old one, yeah. the original, not the remake. Not the... Not, yeah, the original black and white film uh, with An Sung Gi as like a little boy. I mean, it's a really, it's a, just a brilliant film, and I think it's one of the best films of all time. It's no available matter. on DVD yeah. and Blu-ray. Yeah, yeah. Criterion yeah. Collection. Criterion just it, released yeah. it. Yeah. Um, well, and in terms of films coming out, I think Hong Kong Ju uh, is a really important film. Uh, Face Reader. Uh, Snowpiercer, I think, is going to be a really important film. Um, that's, you know, sort of I'm off the, the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, I'm sorry, and the other questions were, you had a, yeah. you answered yeah. pretty much. Okay. For me, uh, the if there is a film everybody has to see, it's uh, it's not very original, but I have to, to say this title because it's Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance because this is the film that... Ma it's one of the films that maybe... that that is responsible for me being super sweaty here. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's one of the reasons uh, I'm doing this job. Like when I saw Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, I was a spectator at Fantasia and it, it, there are very few films in your life that make you you get out of the, of the theater and you just like I'm a new person <laughs> and it's it's really a film that that got me that story the, the way like the, the mix of dark humor and uh, oh it, it, and That's big shock to the system yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, sympathy for man uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, vengeance yeah. is mine yeah. which happens mm. to be the title of a Japanese film. Uh, yeah. And in the... For for the films uh, to see um, uh, Han Gong Ju. Han Gong Ju. Uh, Han Gong Ju. No. The <laughs> Red Family is yeah. uh, a very interesting film. Uh, I, I, I don't... One of the films I had a lot of fun watching but I know it doesn't have so... so Like the reviews are... Oh, not that good, but the, the Untresses for me was a lot of fun. Oh, I oh, really yeah. had yeah, fun yeah. watching the yeah. Untresses. And like it was at an a, a industry screening and people were laughing out loud. And I was like, it's, it's really a film that I think if you want to have fun on, yeah. because Han Gong Ju is a, 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 a like, a, not dark, it's like when I, uh, I watched really it on my, movie, com yeah, 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 it's, yeah. Uh, and you cannot say anything because if you don't have the surprise, all the steps of the, the of filmmaking of directing that leads you to the, the the feeling you have when you know it's like like the film finished and when my computer turned black i saw my face I was, <laughs> it really felt like i had a punch in the gut and it's uh, but uh, yeah so i'm going through and then the entrances great Tom. Yeah. well rufus stole my <laughs> housemaid recommendation uh, but I'll choose another one, which is one of the first Korean films that I saw that really got me into Korean cinema, My Sassy Girl, which came out maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and this, it both reminded me of like American screwball comedies from the 30s with the sort of fast talking and this sort of way you go swerving through genres and are taken on this great ride. I think that one sort of turned me on to Korean cinema, so I recommend that. In terms of films to see, I mean, you guys have covered, you know, uh, the ones that I would probably recommend, but um, it made me think of, you know, so many people here are talking about the industry, which I'm less familiar with, the sort of finance and the business, because I, I guess my way of experiencing Korean films is just kind of seeing them one after the other out of context as much as possible. And it reminded me of years ago, I was in a, a bootleg um, DVD shop in Vietnam, and they had organized it um, in these very broad categories. So romance would include like a silly romantic comedy and a Wong Kar Wai movie, and there was no hierarchy of which one was the big box office hit and which one came from Hollywood and which one came from somewhere else. And I thought this is the way you should really experience movies. Like you shouldn't be kind of prejudiced by what's the next thing that's coming out, what's popular and what should be seen. So, you know, go on to Netflix and just like select Korea and like, you know, just kind of dive in. I think that might be, you know, without think knowing what's the hit and what isn't. And that's be my record. I do. Can I add one? Yeah. Oh, no, go, 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 go. No, you I, started. I just, there is, well, there was just a, a like you said, Netflix. And I think yeah. like, we are living in a golden age of accessibility right yeah. now. We have Hulu, we have Drama Fever, we have Netflix, all streaming content from Korea with subtitles. We have Korean Film Archive with their YouTube channel. There's over 100 yeah. classic Korean films with subtitles yes. for free yeah. on YouTube. 
you know, that are absolutely amazing. And these are films that when I first saw them, I saw one screening without subtitles in the Korean film archive. <laughs> <laughs> and then would have to remember every little detail about that one screening because I was the only. But now you could go on YouTube and just share. And we have our own festivals. Yes, yes. and yes. festivals, of <laughs> course. Festivals, <laughs> of course. Yeah, <laughs> we work pretty hard on that. Yeah. <laughs> a bit, a little bit. Yeah, uh, I think there was a question there. I act I actually have two questions. Um, they're both kind of tied into the last statement, and that's, um, do you find? becoming increasingly more difficult to screen, um, to actually get the films from Korea to screen as companies like CJ are getting more involved in the creation of the film. I, I'm, I work for K-pop stars and also for K-drama stars. So my familiarity with CJ is more on the music side and being able to see how they're both helpful and also sometimes a hindrance in terms of getting mm the entertainment here. Um, and then my other question was in terms of the bubble that, and like kind of the second wave that we're seeing right now in Korean cinema, <laughs> do you think that the casting recently, there's been the increase of casting of Korean top name actors in Hollywood films like Avengers and mm -hmm. Terminator, do you think that's going to be helpful to Korean cinema or a hindrance? Well, let's just start. Uh, maybe Tom, you want to start? Oh well, uh, to the last question. That's that's a, that's a, actually a really interesting question because mm. I don't know if people are curious enough to say, oh, look up this actor that they saw in the Avengers and then go back and watch the Korean movies. I'd I'd like to know if that happens. It would be fantastic. Uh, it would be great. Um, but as for like working with CJ, I've actually found them very helpful. I mean, they just want to get their movies out. I mean, if anything, you know, I'll I'll book a film from them in my festival, and then they've you know by the time it comes out, they've already released it in various forms because they really are working hard to get into the American market. But um, I mean, it hasn't been a problem for me. Uh, you know, certain titles they may say, oh, we want to premiere it at a you know bigger place or something like that. But that's just kind of the business of programming films. But it has. I don't say I don't think it's become more difficult actually. I mean. Same. Well, same here like it's it's the same in every companies I, I i didn't see any any changes in, in the last months or years yeah. uh, but they do more and more uh, semi theatrical like yeah. limited runs they do yes. a lot of theatrical releases yeah. it's, it's harder to book size, premieres you know? yeah, yeah i think yeah. it's harder to book a premiere now that's true because yeah. they're especially we live in new york they release their films on 42nd streets and then you know a couple months after that there's like CJ has their own DVD re yeah. release arm in the US uh, and they subtitle and they have all the special features and they release it. Um, and then as to your, your other question, I think that's more along the lines of Hollywood wants to break into the Asian film market yeah. and Korean stars are so popular in Asia and especially in China, which uh, right now is where everyone is trying to break mm -hmm. into China to get the money. So um, the largest theatrical market. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that's why we see in Avengers and stuff scenes made specifically for, you know, the Chinese audience or scenes set in Korea, which is a very popular, you know, I mean, I hate the term Korean wave, but that's like, that's sort of, they're using this idea to sort of break in. And mm. I think they're, they're also a huge online blog, Tumblr popularity of these pop stars and of these actors and i mean they have a huge you know like look at g dragon i mean right. he has a huge following online of people that don't understand anything he says because they don't speak <laughs> korean but they love his fashion they love his style and they just think he's really cute and so they're like a million school like you know high school u.s high school girls that are like oh my god g dragon is you know mm. but at the same time if seeing one of these actors in a big blockbuster or seeing Lee Byung Hung in in GI Joe. Yeah. Uh, if it can bring even like fifty or two hundred people mm -hmm. uh, in U in the U.S. and Canada and Europe an interest towards Korean cinema, just a, a curiosity, I think it, it's good. Mm -hmm. Good. I think we have time for maybe one last question before we wrap up. Okay, so I guess we can <laughs> conclude with uh, this uh, great, these great questions. Thank you for uh, being thank you. attending, and I hope you uh, learn things from us a little <laughs> bit. I certainly learned things from you guys. Thanks also. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank, thank you.